So again, the focus of our conversation with you all over the next uh, 40 minutes or so is to really talk about fostering resilient leadership in crisis and what does that really mean and look like. And as I just mentioned, from a Marriott perspective, I came three years ago, and as an OD practitioner through and through, um, I, while I love the public sector and I love being a consultant, um, Marriott reached out to me and they said, hey, PJ, we're a $12 billion company. We have about 20 brands. We're buying another 10 brands right now. So we're going to be a 30 brand company and the largest hotel company in our industry. Um, it went from being 5,000 hotels to 7,000 hotels. We now span 130 countries globally. Um, and they really wanted someone to help from a North and South America perspective, think about how do we integrate this business, both from a systems perspective, but also from an organizational perspective, but then most importantly, from a people perspective. And when you step back and you start to think about this, and as I've thought about this, I realized Marriott's had a pretty phenomenal journey of resilience um, that's led us up to this moment in time that I think it's important to really kind of frame today's story around. So on this next slide, as you can see, um, Marriott actually started out as a company called Hot Shops. And it was a small Hot Shops in DC that mostly served root beer floats and hot dogs. And, and over time, they went from being one to having multiple venues in the DC area to eventually in the 30s going into airline food because they got more and more effective. And then in the 50s, they actually went into hotel business. And I think what's really fascinating about the Marriott story that actually really drew me into the company was their corporate values. Um, Mr. Marriott, his father founded the company on this whole aspect of um, if we take care of our people, they will take care of our guest. And that is the, our strategic imperative as we go through and evolve as a business. Fast forward into the 80s and 90s, these values are still the same values that the company still espouses to this day. And the 80s and 90s represented a time in, in the early 2000s where they went from being kind of one brand Marriott hotels to being up to around 20 brands. Um, and that's where they really grew exponentially um, in, in kind of becoming this machine of like, how do we integrate these other organizations, ground them in our values and grow as a business. Um, fast forward to 2016, the company bought Starwood Hotels, as I mentioned previously, and we went from being 20 brands to 30 brands. And again, those values became kind of that bedrock of our organization. Um, but also it became a time where we realized that we needed to step back and really think about not just being a hotel company, but being um, a broader travel company. And this is when Marriott really stepped back and created a vision called, uh, we wanna be the world's favorite travel company. And with that, it gave us permission to continue to expand our, uh, our, expand our brand and our, our strategic focus from being, again, hot shops to airline food, to not just being a hotel company, but how are we an experienced company in the future? Um, fast forward to today. Um, so earlier this year, when we embarked on this year in January, um, we were a $50 billion company. We had 30 brands. Um, we were also selling experiences through Travel Pass. And we were also starting to make probably two to $3 billion a year off credit cards and other loyalty programs. So we started to really diversify as a travel ecosystem. And we were also starting to build new partnerships. You then get to March of this year where a lot of us were um, impacted by COVID-19. And at that point in time, um, it was one of the most challenging things that hit our industry as it did many industries but instead of telling you about what the past few months have been around, I thought I would uh, share a kind of a quick video from our CEO that really describes kind of what have we been through and what's been happening as we've been going through this challenge. So with that, I'm gonna share that story with you all now. Hello, Marriott Associates. I'm here to give you an update on the impact of coronavirus or COVID-19 on our business and the steps we're taking to respond to it. Because of the profound impact COVID-19 is having on so many of us around the world, this is the most difficult video message we have ever pulled together. Our team was a bit concerned about using a video today because of my new bald look. Let me just say that my new look is exactly what was expected as a result of my medical treatments. I feel good and my team and I are 100% focused on overcoming the common crisis we face. Now let's talk about that crisis, COVID-19. Let's start with the health challenge itself. Across our company, the number of COVID-19 infected associates is low, and I'm grateful for this. I want to acknowledge the associates who are dealing with it as a patient, a parent, family member, or friend, and the hundreds of Marriott colleagues who are at this minute quarantined. Our will, well wishes and thoughts are with all of you. In terms of our business, COVID-19 is like nothing we've ever seen before. 
for a company that's 92 years old, that's borne witness to the Great Depression, World War II, and many other economic and global crises. That's saying something. But here are the facts. COVID-19 is having a more severe and sudden financial impact on our business than 9-11 and the 2009 financial crisis combined. The worst quarter we had in those earlier crises saw a roughly 25% decline in hotel revenues on average across the globe. In this case, which began in Greater China in January, we quickly saw a 90% decline in our business in China. In the two months since, we have seen COVID-19 extend to the rest of the world. In most markets, our business is already running 75% below normal levels. There is simply nothing worse than telling highly valued associates, people who are the very heart of this company, that their roles are being impacted by events completely outside of their control. I've never been more determined to see us through than I am at this moment. While it's impossible to know how long this crisis will last, I know we as a global community will come through the other side and that when we do, our guests will be eager to travel this beautiful world again. When that great day comes, we will be there to welcome them with the warmth and care we are known for the world over. As I close, I encourage you to please take care of yourself, your friends and family and the community around you. I wish you good health and a sense of optimism. Together, we can and we will overcome this and we'll thrive once again. Thank you and be well. And, and Arnie really shares it much better than, than I ever could. Um, as, and it was important for me to share that video because I think as you can see, um, one, it really espoused and it helped us share these three lessons that I'll go pretty briefly to because I want to make sure we get time for the conversation. But ultimately, um, people first as a, as, a, as a principle for Marriott is critical. And as you can see through those communications and how we've done this, it's, it's been kind of a central component of how we have managed this challenge and this crisis. Um, I'll also say something that surprised us is when we were going through this, this process and we've also offered kind of an employee buyout process and experience, most of our associates just did not want to participate in it at this time because they said, we believe in Marriott and this culture. And another thing that was interesting for me as I went through this process was um, there is a, an associate website that was created in Facebook that called Survive Marriott. And we initially thought it would be something very negative and very hard. And really it became something for our associates to stay connected with, to talk about Marriott's values, to talk about their stories in their first hotels. Um, they talked about signs of hope. And even though um, our industry is losing billions of dollars um, uh, on a monthly basis, or on a weekly basis and our company's using billions on a monthly basis, um, those values have become something that's been so important to and something that we've tapped into from a leadership and an organizational development perspective to help us manage this time of crisis and challenge that was something unexpected and something more unsizable than we would have seen previously. Second, I think what's been really interesting about this, this opportunity for us as we've stepped back as Marriott is our vision of being the world's favorite travel company, not being the best hotel company, has also enabled us to step back and really think about how do we use this as an opportunity to really, um, one, look at how are we, one, what is our business in the future? How do we go from being beyond hotels because of the shock factor of that and what it means for our business? But then two, it's also helped us realize that there's certain things that because we're so big, we have not had the opportunity to step back and really kind of unfreeze the organization, make a lot of positive change and now do that. And we've now been on this process of discovery of doing that both from a workforce as well as an organization design perspective while can kind of continuing to protect our values. And then I think the third element for us really has been, and the third element for me in my role of leading kind of business strategy and business transformation across North and South America for Marriott has been, how do we help our leaders go from being ambiguity absorbers or, or how do we help them not be ambiguity amplifiers and be ambiguity absorbers? And what does that look like, both in terms of how they drive value and focus on concrete action, concrete action, but then two, um, how do I look at this from an inclusion lens? Um, I share this story with Anne briefly, but I think one of the one of the most fascinating points about Zoom meetings, and we're in the Zoom culture right now, is sometimes it helps you to step back and look at everyone who's in a meeting or participation, and it allows you to think about who's there and what are their their cognitive differences, their racial or ethnic differences, and and who and how are these conversations happening? And I think that whole aspect of inclusion as a part of this is really critical. And based on these three lessons and conversations that Anne and I have had, we've really realized that there's three roles of an OD practitioner plays 
in terms of how do you manage through crisis? And it's that of being a culture architect, of being a visionary, and of being a coach. And what we want to do right now is actually, Anne is going to share a brief story around each one of these archetypes, but we want to share a story, kind of have some questions and conversations with each of you um, using the chat box feature just to help manage the conversation. Um, and then we'll go pillar by pillar of each of these hats. So again, I'm going to hand it over to Anne. If you have questions, please use your chat box. Um, I'm going to then moderate questions out loud and uh, let's continue the conversation. So Anne, over to you. Great, thank you very much, um, PJ. Um, the organization, the, the uh, organizational experience that I'm going to share with you is one we decided that I would, from my consulting experience, that I would choose one that is not from a non, not from a, a profit oriented organization. Um, and also, so what I'm going to be doing is sharing a story with you um, of some consulting that I did about 10 years ago with um, one of the inspector general's offices in the federal government. So for those of you that might be familiar with that, the inspector generals are the really the people who keep each of our agencies honest and keep them, um, they decrease or reveal fraud, they do all kinds of investigation, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not gonna say which one, um, I have permission from all of my work with them in saying that much, but not to be any more specific. The precipitating factor for the change in the work I was doing with them was that the inspector general, the person at the top, um, realized that he was in a very competitive market for the very best people. Um, and at, at that particular time, that was really true. And, he, and they, this inspector general, as is true of many, but I think especially of this office, their reputation was um, of being one of the best in the country, that they had a reputation of doing um, top-notch work. They had really sharp, smart people. And they also had a strong sense of integrity. Um, they did not go after people for anything other than very concrete um, abridgments of the law. And there was very generally, there was a good morale in the company. But the inspector general realized that if he was going to be able to continue that over time, that he needed to make this a more attractive place to work because the work was the expectations were high and people were working very long hours. And so he decided that he had to do, they had to do a better job of work balance. That was obviously a um, particularly timely thing at that time. And so he brought me in and I brought in a variety of doctoral students from the School of Public Policy, which is now the Shar School, and we began <coughs> excuse me, doing work. Um, and what's relevant for this particular group of roles that PJ and I decided to use um, would be that in this particular case, the culture was such that there was a very strong sense of what their core was. And people were very proud of it. They were proud of having the reputation that they had, both within, the, um, within each of the five divisions, but also in the whole federal government and among other inspector generals. And so one of our roles, I think, when I, we began this work was to keep reminding them of that, to really talk about it, to give verbal acknowledgement to it, so that in a way they began, they became part of the people who were perpetuating the culture. And so that when they worked with us, whether it was in the survey or in focus groups or in all kinds of other ways that I'll mention to you a little more later, um, that they knew what the goal was and that they then became part of how we protect and we were going to protect and anchor those values so that those weren't jeopardized as we move forward. So any questions on that one or to, uh, PJ, would you like to add anything about this particular role of a OD professional? vis-a-vis -vis Marion.
I think you might be muted. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So a couple of questions, Anne, coming through, and, and I think, Anne, I think um, your story and my story, looking at it from both lines, really helped describe kind of the role a culture architect can play as an OD practitioner. Um, with that, the first question I'm going to shoot to you, Anne, is can you describe a little bit more about your consulting relationship with the government agency, just to understand more of the context of what that relationship looked like to mean in terms of helping them in this way? Uh, yes. Well, they were looking for help. And um, they came to the School of Public Policy and they asked if they had any faculty who could work with them. And so there were several of us who talked with them and I ended up doing the work with them. And I think part of it was that they wanted to be able to work with people who um, had some firm academic background, but who also were very used to working with people from other than an academic perspective. And I had gone back to graduate school later. I had worked uh, many years before I went back to graduate school and I had always done consulting. And so we just actually developed a contract with them. And I think one of the other things that was appealing to them was that I, we were delighted to find opportunities for our doctoral students in public policy to have an opportunity to get some hands-on work and also to find some resources, which we were constantly looking for, for stipends for our doctoral students. So it was a really good relationship that way. So I worked directly with the Inspector General and with that person's leadership team. Um, and I ended up then developing a relationship with, there were five divisions, um, headquarters were in DC, are in DC, and then they had field offices all over the country. And I worked directly and immediately started trying to build a relationship with each of the five division directors. Thank you so much, Ann. Um, so Rick just asked me a question around Marriott and he asked essentially, how is Marriott reframing um, the future when it looks so unclear right now? Um, so Rick, that, that is a great question. I totally agree um, with some of the other comments on there. So what, what's interesting about this point in time is, um, as, so a couple of different things. So I think one, um, back in 1988 or 1989, in, in the late 80s, there was another economic crisis um, where um, Marriott was actually in, in a pretty bad position. And there's a famous story inside Marriott where um, we were at a point where we weren't able to make payroll for a lot of our staff. Um, and so we ended up taking Mr. Marriott, had a relationship with the CEO of Pepsi at the time. And he called over to Pepsi and, and called a couple of other CEOs. And Pepsi actually gave us a direct loan to make payroll for one of our quarters in the 80s. And as, a, as that moment in time happened, what happened to the company is we decided we needed to get out of the, the business of owning hotels. We needed to get into the business of being a brand and services company. And at that point in time, we actually sold all of our hotels. And today out of our 7,000 hotels, I believe Marriott, um, Marriott True Corporation owns less than 10 hotels. And most of them are because they're either partially owned or investment properties, but we became an asset light organization. And we reposition Marriott as truly a licensing, franchising platform company that really sells kind of brands and brand equity. Fast forward to today, as we think about the future and, and building on our brands, um, where we think about our, our vision, our future is much more about how do we continue to tap into that and how do we create a travel marketplace? And, and, and the way we're looking at the future is really one, um, our credit cards is one example of that. But then two, when you think about our loyalty members, um, right now Marriott has 150 loyalty members. They spend 65 times more than the average member. And, and what we've realized is how do we help protect them and create more seamless travel experiences through partnering with airports and airlines? How do we provide different differentiated services for them? And, and really building on that whole aspect of, again, not being a hotel company, but being a travel company. And, and so to do that, we one are focusing on one, how do you evolve our workforce and how do we continue to bring in new talent? And up until probably about three years ago, a lot of Marriott talent was homegrown. And we're now in this point where we realize that we're, we're becoming more of a platform and products company. And we want to make those investments on digital platforms and as well as new products and services like Merit Homes and Villas or like credit cards or travel experiences. Because no matter what, 
if people are not willing to necessarily always feel as safe traveling in hotels or having large meetings as they do today, let's try to meet our, our consumers and our guests where they need to be. And as a result of that, that whole vision and focus on a, a platforms and products company becomes very essential to us. Great, um, Jay. In the interest of time, I think perhaps I'm going to take what you just said, talked about with Marriott, and shift over to the visionary hat, if that's okay with you. Um, one of the things I was really curious. Yes. Real, real quick, uh, just a quick announcement, just so everyone is aware. We yeah. actually are going to be ending at 2.15 now oh, um, so okay. we got it extended a little bit so you have you have a little bit extra time <laughs> okay so pj was there anything you wanted to add there before we go on um there was one other question i'll, I'll, I'll continue just to hit on pretty uh, i'll hit on quickly uh from a mirror perspective so someone asked me the question of how do you maintain um core values across 30 different brands yeah. i think that is a great question um and, and, and honestly, it requires, um, one, it's, it's in the way we do our hiring, fundamentally across all of our brands, because every brand has its own ethos, whether you're a W or St. Regis or Marriott, you mm -hmm. will add on top of that. But those core five values, keeping them simple and focused and building that into our hiring, building that into our training, building in that into all of our, our materials and tools that we use to kind of create the employee experience is really essential to that. And, and again, maintaining the simplicity of those values becomes very critical because then on top of those values, each brand adds its own ethos. Um, so again, a, a, a quick answer, but wanted to make sure we address that. Um, with that, I, there's a couple of other questions, but I, I think to Anne's point, let's keep going to visionary. Let's spend a little bit of time on visionary because some of the questions I'm seeing will focus on that a little bit more. Um, and then from there, we will continue this conversation. So Anne, why don't, why don't you talk a little bit more about the role of the OD practitioner as a visionary and helping build vision within an organization? And then we can address some of these questions that I see coming through. Okay, great. Um, one of the things that you talked about was um, literally taking what had been primarily a hotel orientation and shifting the, um, the core of who you were as a company. And that really is sort of the essence of the visionary hat or the visionary um, practitioner. And that is that when there are gonna be changes, whether they're forced on us by a crisis or whether they are planned change as in the federal agency with whom I was working, with which I was working, where they planned for a major change to take place and then set upon, asked me to come in and other people to come in and help with that change. Um, in the change is inher inherently our opportunities. And in COVID, even though we all know, I think most of us have had the experience and PJ and I were actually just talking about this before everybody came into the session, that even with all the downsides and the awful things that are happening with COVID, most of us can see a silver lining in somewhere either in work or personal life. And that's really one of the ways that I often work with organizations. And that is to say, they're, they're one of the things we know, and Singe said this, and we've heard it other places this morning, one thing we can be sure of is there's gonna be continuous change. And, and one of the things that's different about my story is that it was a planned change, whereas PJ is giving us one that is very immediate in all of our lives, and that was not planned at all. That was something that they had to react in the moment. But one of the opportunities that it gave us, and one of the things that, one of the ways that we were able to frame all of our outreach, which was ex very, very extensive in the uh, agency, was to frame it in terms of an opportunity, an opportunity to really improve the workplace and to work the, improve the work-life balance in their lives. And because I emphasized and worked so closely with people around the confidentiality of their input, and we did a lot of things to really protect that, we got a massive amount of honesty. Um, and of course, what most change projects reveal is you typically have crises within even the best intentioned plan. 
Um, and so what we ended up doing is both maximizing the opportunities and helping people see them as an opportunity. But one of the crises that emerged was um, some very serious issues, especially in one of the divisions, but it was not just in that division, that there was some leadership, there were some people in leadership who were um, not perceived as leaders who were bringing out the best in their workers. And so there was a good deal of resentment about that. And we also discovered that there tended to be a relationship between color of skin and where that happened and where it didn't happen. And so one of the things that we worked on a lot, and I can give you one specific example, um, was trying to help the leadership recognize how this was happening. So one of the things that we did in order to gather input was that we had five national regional meetings over a year where every employee in that region in the whole office, which was thousands of people, uh, were invited to a regional meeting. And of course that was all paid for by the agency. And then I did work um, during that I think it was about a four day meeting. I did work with each of people in each of the divisions and in the division where there was an issue uh, specifically around race and a lack of development in the employees was that in the very first meeting in the very first few minutes of the, of the session, which was several hours, somehow it came up that some people had changed name tags and that some other people had taken their name tags off. And so I acknowledged that that was happening and I asked were people feeling uncomfortable that I would report back things that were said and they acknowledged that that was true. So I encouraged everyone to take their name tags off. And I assured them that uh, there would not, I wouldn't even identify the region that what I was doing was aggregating all of the feedback I got across the whole country, and that I would both give the report to that division director, but that I would also sit down one-on-one -on -one in a long session and elaborate without revealing any identities. Um, and that became very challenging later on because um, there were a few instances where action probably needed to be taken. And then I was faced with, am I gonna hold true to my promise to maintain confidentiality in the interest of isolated incidents that needed to be corrected? Or was I going to hold true to my commitment to the employees? And I ultimately held true to the commitment with the employees, but that was a very difficult decision for me. And it uh, created a lot of work that I had to do specifically with that division director and some of the leaders in that, in that division. So these are crises within well-planned change that emerge. <laughs> Anne, can you talk a little bit about um, from a COVID-19 <clears throat> perspective and in the public sector, <clears throat> um, sometimes we feel like the, the resistance to change even in this climate is really hard. Yes. And with that in mind, how do you help an agency either revisit its vision or, or revisit or define its, its values um, in a time where there's just so much resistance to that? What, can, you, can you just describe how you would approach that and your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think for me, so often with any of this kind of thing, the pre-work that we do before we actually begin working with people is probably the one of the most important things. And I say that in specific, specifically in addressing that question, PJ, because it really depends on the context. What's precipitating the change? How do people feel about it? You know, who are the people? What are the problems? But in this particular case, before I ever did anything, before we did any survey or meetings or anything, I did a lot of pre-work talking with people, one-on-one -on -one as much as I could, and actually traveling to field offices and all of that kind of thing, so that I knew what some of the problems were. 
And by knowing what the problems are and how people feel, then often what we're able to do is to frame whatever the interventions are in tune with what they need and they're looking for. So it, it, um, it, there, it decreases the resistance. And sometimes what can happen is, and, and when it works, I've seen it happen many times, is people get excited about it. They want to get, they want to jump on board and become a part of the effort. When it doesn't work so well, we all know the result, you know, the resistance gets deeper. Absolutely. Um, the, re the resistance does get deeper unless you have a lot of those one-on-one. -on -one, um, yes. It, it requires that disclosure and that relationship to really become the foundation of the work for it to really anchor. That's right. Yeah. So I see a question um, for me regarding kind of um, as Marriott as as Marriott recognizes that travel probably will never return, and and I kind of answered this a little bit previously about how we're looking to become more of a platform and products company. There's a question around what core competencies are required, um, and I, I think that is a really great question because we we've asked ourselves that much more recently, especially as we've gone through. Um, kind of re, what we're calling it rebuilding Marriott. Um, I've actually left, I've been leading the effort for North and South America of helping redesign both what is the, the on-property model of the future for hotels look like, and then also what is the, what is the headquarters of tomorrow look like? And we've stepped back and looked at all of our traditional functions like HR and finance and IT and, and engineering. I never thought I would learn so much about hotel um, HVAC systems, but I have. <laughs> um, and, and, and as we've stepped back, we've realized that Fundamentally, we need a different type of, of associate in the future. Um, we need one more utility infielder, so more cross-trained associates, and we need more agile operating models. Um, but then two, having individuals that can lean in and provide a consulting mindset, no matter wh whether your role is a consultant or whether your role is at a hotel is really important because one of the biggest challenges that we've seen is that um, when you start having state laws and local laws and business models all come into contradiction, what it does is it manifests at a property perspective that general managers need to be able to work in, a, in, a, in a, an environment that's way more complex and way more ambiguous than it's ever been before. So individuals that can bring a consultative mindset that can lean into ambiguity, um, that are lifelong learners as, we, as we've always talked about as part of ODKM, but then also are willing to lean into digital and lean into technology becomes more critical than ever before. And when you think about that, um, a lot of our travelers or passengers, one, they want to connect and they want to have a seamless experience. And the best way to enable that is digital. So having a digitally enabled workforce, um, both from a corporate perspective or at a hotel or in a Marriott Homes and Villas environment, becomes much more essential in the future. And as we've stepped back and we've started to think about our workforce models and our long range workforce planning, those are, those are the competencies that become front and center for us. Um, with that, I'm going to quickly look at some of these questions. Um, yeah, there was one for you that I was going to ask you to address, and, and that is, are, will Marriott be offering training for the employees who've been laid off so that they can transition to these new emerging needs? Absolutely. Marriott does offer um, outplacement services, which includes training as well as um, job search support. Um, and, then, and then I'll say as a result of COVID, we've actually activated partnerships with um, several universities um, and several, um, several off-the-shelf learning programs to help equip our associates in, in just very different ways in terms of facilitation skill sets, in terms of um, how to lean into digital technology and how to learn about different roles in different industries. Um, so we've actually tripled down, I would say we've tripled our investment in our learning management system over the past several months to give our associates access to those assets. Mm -hmm. And I'll just quickly address a question uh, to me, which was, uh, if I could say a little bit more about the pre-work uh, balance between, um, you know, the fact finding and getting the full story and so on. And I'll just try to do it very briefly. I learned as much as I could possibly learn about what inspector generals do and also about the agency that was uh, being overseen here. But probably, and that's natural, that's data gathering. And, and, but by far the most important thing was having what sometimes felt like almost endless conversations. And I've learned way back that as a consultant, when you don't have relationships and you don't have any kind of a reputation in an organization, 
you really have to build that. Um, and that's what I was doing. So I was partially building the relationships. So when the data began to come in and people had to hear things that might not be easy to hear, then we had something, you know, there was some trust that had been developed. But also it was in, in valuable in terms of just learning how they saw their own division and how they saw what worked well within their teams and especially within their divisions and how the divisions interfaced with each other, what worked well and what was not working well. So that I, and that's always one of the challenges as an external consultant is getting up to speed fast enough. And so it takes time and real, for me, real concentration. So shall we move to the next, the piece on coaching, or did you have a question? I wanted to answer this one quick question and then, and then I'll hand over yeah, to you. Please this, do. Uh, I'm coaching. So the next question was, what's happening with Marriott's brick and mortar hotels? Uh -huh. um, so one, we don't own a lot of those hotels. Um, we own about 7,000 of them. Uh, we, we own the brands and the services around them. Um, that said, um, one, we've seen a, a pretty good spike in travel over summer, which has been helpful, but we have stepped back and recognized that one, some of our hotels are, um, I would say that there will be hotels that will be closed and the, fun, the fundamental enterprise and footprint will be different in the future. Um, and then that said, for the hotels that are remaining, we've been spending a lot of time figuring out how to partner with uh, other companies and helping reimagine what the hotels, uh, how the hotels are operating and used in the future. Um, three quick examples of that are, one, we are partnering with Amazon to turn some of our larger hotels into mini Amazon distribution centers, just given the demand of virtual shopping and business. And we're now looking to expand that with other partners. Um, two, um, there's actually a huge demand for people that want to leave their homes right now, and they want to rent out <laughs> office spaces during the day. So we're actually looking at how do we uh, retrofit uh, hotel conference rooms and or hotel bedrooms into um, spaces where people can safely and securely leave their home for a few days to do work and essentially create um, lower cost virtual workstations. And then three, there's, there's been a, and, and I think this creates, um, it's a, there's a broader theme around COVID-19 that there is silver lining because it forces different types of partnerships and reimagination of the way you use assets and businesses. And, and we're also partnering with different rental car companies now to use a lot of our parking garages and to use a lot of our different facilities to help store cars and what have you. And, and, and these different types of partnerships are causing us to step back and think about how do we reimagine the uses of hotels in the future and, and how do we go to what kind of, and there's a question around KPIs, like right now, our number one, our number one metric in industry is called RevPAR, revenue per, uh, per room essentially. And what we realize is we need to go to revenue per square foot and or revenue per guest. And how do you think about flipping how you drive revenue in a completely different way by flipping those KPIs in this context? And for us, that's been very core of how we think about the vision and reimagining those KPIs, which will also enable us to reimagine not only our business, but also those hotels, which still continue to be a big part of our portfolio. Great questions. And with that, I'm going to ask Anna to talk a little bit more about kind of the, the role of the OD practitioner as a coach during times of crisis. And what does that mean for, for leaders during, the, during these times? So Anna, over to you. Okay. One of the most important things I think to, I want to sort of set as a base when I mention anything about coaching is that sometimes when we hear that word, we think about the formal quote, coach relationship, which is one that's very, very important, of course. And, um, but, but I think as a leader, um, the more a leader can have the mindset that potentially every conversation that they have could be a teaching, a teachable moment or a coaching moment or a guiding moment. Um, and I don't mean to be, you know, inauthentic and to be um, on the lookout or whatever, but just try to develop the mindset that as we're talking with people in our organizations or across organizations, there is the potential to open mindsets and to help people see things maybe from a different point of view or the point of view of other people in the organization that might be being perceived as troublemakers or problems uh, without the recognition that the difference of their experience may in fact be something that our organization desperately needs to learn. And it, it's really at the core of what we mean by inclusion. If in fact, all of the people in an organization, the more heterogeneous, excuse me, the more homogeneous employees look and are at the core, 
the more vulnerable the organization is because they may not be hearing what the population that that organization is serving needs and what they're saying and uh, could really jeopardize the organization in a very serious way. And so one of the things which I've made reference to when I talked about the pre-work and the agency within, within which I was working was that I was having all of these conversations, but I was often also doing some coaching. Um, so in some of my initial organ uh, conversations with some of the leaders, I was trying to sort of build the ground for them to anticipate that they, as we gathered input, they would probably be requested to do things that they might not be predisposed to want to do. And trying to create the mindset and the frame of reference that, in fact, it might be in the long run, part of what needs to happen in the organization so that they would be able to retain their best workers and also be able to attract the very smartest and best people when they had openings in the future. So helping them see how it was in their self-interest to do that. Um, let's see, why don't I turn it over to you and then I can come back in a minute. Definitely, Anne. Um, so Alex has a question, Anne, that I think it would be good for both of us to actually answer because okay. we probably would have complementary but different perspectives on it. Um, what piece of advice can you share for new order practitioners in terms of playing that role as a coach, um, especially in terms of maybe being new in, in their work context? Um, and do you want to answer that first or would you like me to in terms of what advice you would give? Well, I, let me just say this. Um, I think some people uh, are sort of naturally inclined to be um, coaches in the sense that um, they listen to people, they ask questions, they really uh, try to learn from people, they tend to find it easy to put themselves in another person's shoes and see how it might look from that perspective. But for many, many, many of us, that doesn't, it's not second nature. And so it requires, I think, really developing those skills and there are a lot of really good opportunities especially in the dc area for sure uh, to get some guidance and coaching and training uh, maybe even getting a certificate on the other hand any really good staff development program will have excellent training around how you help develop the people in your organization so that they will be doing their best work, but also, and this is really critical to me, is how do you create the conditions within which people do their best work and they're able to make exceptions and they're, um, uh, they're able to make real contributions and they're able to disagree. And this is probably one of the most important things. What can each of us do to create an environment so that we can bring up our disagreements or an alternative point of view, or we can ask the hard questions, or we can even surface some disagreements and we're not penalized for it, that in fact the response is, okay, let's find a time and a place to talk about this. And they'll know that that will actually be appreciated. And every one of us in an organization contributed to whether that atmosphere, that enabling environment is present or not. And so let me turn it to you, PJ. I love everything you said, Anne, and couldn't agree more. And um, as I step back and I think about this kind of third pillar, or this third role, um, I think it probably should say coach slash advisor, because I think I was, as I thought about it, we use the word coach, and I know that means something very specific, especially in our community. Um, but I think part of this is how do you really elevate to that role of being a, a strategic advisor and being a part of that decision making table. And when I when I think about that role and, and how I've been able to evolve into that role within Deloitte and now within Marriott and with clients, for me it really comes down to kind of three things. So one, it's it's always start with inquiry. Really just seek to understand. Because I think in, in the, the spectrum of communication, there's inquiry and there's advocacy. And and sometimes we we tend to go somewhere in the middle or you lean towards advocacy. And I think to start off as a really great advisor, it's really trying to dig deep with those what questions and really understand kind of what is what is what is part of what's going on. 
I think two, finding diplomatic ways that are grounded in your values to call out truths um, in hard conversations. Uh, an example for me in that is, and I shared this with Anna, but uh, I was on a particular Zoom call recently at work or, or actually back in April when we first started this. And I realized I was like, oh my God, there's like three people of diversity on this pretty, pretty senior leadership call. What is this? And I, and I called that out to some of those leaders and I said, we have to change and evolve from this. Um, and, and, and since then, we've obviously have been in a, a kind of a mini transformation during this time of crisis, but it's also helped us really step back and think about inclusion differently. And then, and then I think the third, so again, inquiry, call out truths. I think the third piece is, um, I think we often, a lot of leaders don't always understand, especially during times of crisis, they don't understand the value they add or they question it during time of crisis. Um, and I think it's really important if, as the OD practitioner and as that business advisor and as that, as that thought partner is, how do you help leaders and teams connect with where do they drive value and how does that link to the vision or the values of the business and helping them stay grounded and draw that connection? Because in moments of, of, in time of crisis, I think we often lose sight of that. And the more you can help people find that connection uh, and the more you're listening to them and the more you're calling out truths, all of a sudden you become this person that everyone goes to to help for advice and counsel as that advisor and as that coach. Um, and, and, and what's been interesting for me and Marriott over the past few weeks is we've, we've started to rebuild our future and we think about where people are going in, into the organization in the future. Um, they've come to me now as a result of like, hey, where do you think I should apply? Or how do you think I, how, how do I position or place for this? Or what does that look like for me? And, and where, what do you think makes the most sense? Because this world that we're designing is so different. And I don't know how to connect to it based on the world today. And, and, and for me, that, that role of coach and advisor, when you can, again, bring inquiry, bring truths, but then also help people feel connected to those vision and the, that vision and those values, um, it becomes a very powerful combination that really helps you grow as that advisor and coach um, within, this, with, within any context. Excellent. Thank you very much, PJ. There was another question that I thought I would see if you could address, and that is, could you say something about your relationship, Marriott's relationship with labor unions? Absolutely. Um, so Merit has an interesting relationship with labor unions because um, a lot of them mostly exist within specific hotel markets. Yeah. I will say it's a relationship that based on market, it varies. Um, I will say though, as a part of the journey that we've been on in terms of evolving our operating models, um, two things that have been kind of core tenants for me and my team as we've, we've kind of driven this change is one, um, and I learned this when I was in government doing kind of OD work, one, bring the union unions on up front in terms of how you think about the OD operating model or you think about the future operating model. Um, what changes do you want to make to roles? Make them a part of that conversation from, from early on concept. And similarly in Marriott, um, um, we actually have 450 owners that actually own the hotels that are actually paying Marriott to help manage them in some instances or paying the franchise agreements and, and bringing both those owners as well as unions along this journey with us. Um, to be just very frank and, and no one please don't quote me off the record, it's been unbelievably painful. The amount of conference calls we've had to have, the amount of helping them understand the value proposition of these changes, but bringing them on this journey from the very beginning and letting them know the data that we're seeing, the challenges we're trying to face. Um, also surveying our owners, surveying our associates, surveying our unions and making them a part of this process and giving, them, giving us that data to help frame the conversations has probably been one of the most critical things we've done to get buy-in because instituting this change across 7,000 hotels with 450 um, owners and probably roughly about 30 to 40 unions requires a level of engagement that um, I didn't think was possible in four months, but because we did it early and often, it, it did make it tenable. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we have about two or three minutes left, um, and I'm just looking... What about equity issues? Is there anything you wanted to add about that, PJ? Um, I know we've said a fair amount, but there might be something in specific. I think the, the major thing about equity is I think, um, I will tell you what, it is always terrifying to raise the question. Um, I know I probably sound really confident now, but I will tell you I've been in meetings where um, we've been, we were planning a big leadership meeting this year actually prior to COVID. And I remember thinking about all the plenary speakers and I'm like, and I was just soaked in sweat and freaking out. And I'm like, we do we realize that every single person on stage is 50 years old and, and a white man and no offense to our, our Caucasian <laughs> older members in this audience, but I'm like, there is something fundamentally wrong with this. And, and part of it is just truly being courageous 
and having faith in what you want to do and being centered in that because there's there's no other way to do it and i will tell you no matter what every time you challenge the status quo or challenge uh, a matrix of domination or what have you it's it's terrifying it, it just it is it is absolutely and completely terrifying um but just letting those words come out when they're your truth is just so important in this context or any context um, I couldn't agree more, and I can speak to that very briefly from both perspectives, as, a, as I've mentioned many times. Um, I was a professional woman trying to break through in the 70s in the South, and I was the one who wasn't acceptable. But what I've learned as I've gotten older is that what people need more than anything are allies who are part of the dominant group. And so whoever we are, we have a really important role to play. And even though I'm a woman as a white person, it's infinitely easier for me to say those hard things and to bring up those issues. And so I think that's a huge responsibility. The organization, not only are people treated unfairly when we don't pay attention to equity, but the organization will suffer because of a lack of diverse input if we all come from the same background, so.